Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about heavy metal. First, very briefly, we have a new patron. Thank you very much to Wayne, our newest patron. Woohoo! Today we have an interview episode. Back in the spring, we spoke to Jeremy Swist about heavy metal music and the ancient world. Jeremy did his PhD at the University of Iowa with a dissertation entitled A Principio Reges, The Reception of the Seven Kings of Rome in Imperial Historiography from Tiberius to Theodosius. He is currently a lecturer in the Department of Classical Studies at Brandeis University. He has been giving a number of talks about heavy metal music and the classics recently, and is organizing an entire conference on the subject, Heavy Metal and Global Premodernity, happening online February 24th to 26th, 2022. Follow Jeremy at Metal Classicist and his co-organizer at Naylor Davis on Twitter to learn more and get updates when the conference website is available. We're really glad to have him here to talk about this fascinating topic. A brief content warning, there is discussion of racism and racist ideologies in this podcast. Hi, Jeremy. Thanks so much for coming on. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the opportunity to join you guys and talk about stuff. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll start with that stuff. We, we usually start with our guests asking some variant of this question. So I will ask... I know that one of, and we can talk about some of your other interests, but one of your main interests is the combination or the overlap between metal music, as in, and the ancient world. So can you tell us where that interest comes from? Or, you know, where did the, are those two different parts of your life that have ended up together? How did that happen? Well, I think it's probably uh, symptomatic of, you know, how when you're an academic and uh, your academic life slowly devours the rest of your life. And because these are two worlds that, you know, started separate and then slowly came together mm -hmm. in many ways. And partly just because the more that I kind of saw them in the same context, the more kind of similarities and parallels I could draw to the point where, you know, it's not just here's a bunch of songs that sing about Julius Caesar and Medusa and Alexander and all of that. But, you know, there's actually culturally heavy metal and classics have uh, very similar kind of dynamics as well as problems, which we can get into, but we can sort of trace back to where things started for me. And uh, an interesting coincidence is that the same time I got into classics was about the same time I got into heavy metal, which was around uh, the beginning of high school back in 2003. And that's when I took my first Latin class. And I, about that same time, I was already sort of getting into like some of your typical gateway drug bands for heavy metal, like Linkin Park, Limp Bizkit. And then that kind of goes on to Metallica and, you know, that kind of surface level, you know, really well-known stuff. And at the same time, I became friends with a guy in uh, that Latin class named Nick Adams, who actually went on to the University of Toronto, which is why I'm familiar with that campus, because I visited <laughs> him there. It's a nice, nice place, except for that library. So anyway, he got me into Slayer, and he sort of was getting into metal the same time I was, and we sort of became kind of buddies. We'd go to the record store every weekend and uh, buy some new records or on, and CDs, and uh, you know we'd listen to them when we got home, and we started going to concerts together and everything, and it kind of went from there. But we were also like had similar scholarly interests. You know, we were both taking Latin. We were in history. He went on to be a history major at UT. And by the time we got to AP Latin in our senior year of high school, we were really, you know, deep into kind of the underground metal scene at that point. And we were also taking AP Virgil specifically. I don't know if you guys have the AP we don't have system the similar, in no. Canada, we but... Um, I know what it is, though. It's prepared, okay. Like, so yeah, basic, preparation for a university, right? Like ba it's basically, it's basically an advanced uh, course where you earn college credit 
in high school before you before you go to college. Mm-hmm. So with so with my AP Latin credits, I didn't have to take as many Latin credits once I got to college. And so we read Virgil and we read the Aeneid. And as especially when we got to book two, where it, things got really violent with the sack of mm-hmm. Troy and you know Laocoon being devoured by the the serpent and all of this you know merciless slaughter. Nick and I turned to each other and were like, "Man, this is." This reads kind of like heavy metal lyrics, like death metal lyrics, or, you know, where, you know, there's war and violence and sort of this, the darkness of human nature on sort of this epic tableau. Uh, And we thought, you know, and Nick was also kind of learning guitar at this point. And so we decided, you know what, we don't know about any heavy metal bands that, you know, sing about Virgil's Aeneid. Why don't we do it ourselves? And so we formed this little project and, you know, the music wasn't very good. We didn't really know what we were doing, but, you know, I wrote the lyrics and they were basically inspired by what we happened to be reading in AP at the time. Hey, mm-hmm. So uh, so we have a song about Laocoon being, you know, torn apart by the serpent. We have a song about Neoptolemus, you know, breaking into the palace, etc. And, uh, and so that sort of was, that didn't really go anywhere, but it sort of planted the seed of this idea that there was some kind, there was this congeniality between a lot of the themes in certain aspects of classics, you know, epic literature, you know, violence, war, but also other themes, you know, are there as well from mythology and history as well. But it wasn't really until I got to grad school that I discovered that there was a lot more metal out there than I thought that that engaged with these topics up to the point where there's entire concept albums out there on that on the Aeneid, on mm. the Trojan War, on the Odyssey, on the career of Alexander, the Battle of Thermopylae, Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars, the list goes on, all right? it's various Roman emperors, as well as just individual songs by by bands that otherwise don't tend to engage with those topics frequently. And that makes up the majority of kind of the songs out there. They're kind of these one-offs that a band does, like for instance, Mm -hmm. Alexander's The Great by Iron Maiden, you know, is only one of a a handful of songs they've written on classical topics along with The Ides of March and uh, Flight of of Icarus. And so if you count those songs, those individual one-offs, it adds up to uh, a couple thousand songs total that you can go and listen to. One of my grad school professors, Robert Ketterer, has this kind of running joke. He studies classical reception in opera music. And so, you know, you, you could name a topic in ancient myth or history, and he would say, there's an opera written about that. Um, <laughs> right. You know, yes, there you really know, is. La, yeah. La Clemencia de Tito and all of that. Well, I could probably say the same thing and say there's a metal song about that if you name, you know, whatever myth or individual figure from antiquity, mythical or historical or event or whatever, you know, not there's not a metal song on everything, not the more obscure stuff, but you'll be surprised at how deeply a lot of these artists read the sources to find stories that, you know, would be compatible with kind of the themes that they explore in their music. For instance, you know, there's a band out of California called Serpent Rider, and the vocalist is from Greece, and uh, he's clearly read his Apollonius because they have a song about the that episode from book uh, two of the Argonautica where Polydeuces and Amicus the king of the Bibrikians have that boxing contest. And that's just never been done before. And it's, mm-hmm. it's a wonderful little song called Pour Forth for Quidius. Uh, I can probably put that in the show notes since I mentioned mm-hmm. it. Uh, yeah, I'll after, get you after. to send me send me links yeah. afterwards. Yeah, I can make a playlist or anything. Oh, yeah, be- And, you know, that's the other thing that to keep in mind is, you know, just as, you know, comedies and tragedies were, you know, musical performance with sights and sounds, you know, these, you know, you can only appreciate, really appreciate this music if you actually, you know, listen to the music, see the album artwork, see it in relation to the other songs. And in addition to reading the lyrics to kind of see how kind of image and word and sound come together to create this kind of powerful narrative that explores, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these topics, which we can can talk about numerous examples. But anyway, so what got me interested in it research-wise was, interestingly enough, I am there was a Camwis panel back in 2014, 2015, you know, at Baylor, and I ended up actually not 
making it to that conference. But basically, two uh, classicists, one is uh, Osman Umerhan at University of Mexico and uh, Chris Fletcher, who's at uh, Louisiana State University. They're the ones who kind of got the ball rolling on kind of the scholarly uh, study of what I would call heavy metal classicism. (laughs) And so they did this panel basically on, you know, classics and heavy metal. And I didn't actually submit to it because I didn't think at that time that there was really much to go on. I thought that, you know, as opposed to like Vikings and, you know, other Mm -hmm. areas of history and mythology, just classical topics were, you know, not as compatible or just not as frequent in heavy metal that it wasn't really a thing. But the really, but the the issue was I just wasn't digging deeply enough. Mm -hmm. And what I really, what, What really made the difference here is that I discovered there is a search function on the website called the Encyclopedia Metallum. And you can tell a classicist was not consulted in in naming that, Uh, (laughs) but partly because the Encyclopedia Metallica was a thing from the early 80s that already took the name and has nothing to do with it. The, the band Metallica. But anyway, <laughs> that's that's being pedantic as usual. It is also called the Metal Archives. If you go to metal-archives.com, and it's basically, it's a open source database of every metal band since the early 70s that has existed with recorded material. And you can go onto that site and you can just search for any band and you can see you know, photos of the bands, their discography. Uh, a lot of them have lyrics available and a lot of other information that's very useful for doing this kind of research. Right. You know, I, I, it's my bread and butter. It's, it's as essential to me as, you know, Perseus uh, is to, you know, a classicist or, or you know, the mm-hmm. Liddell and Scott and all of that or the OCD. And they have a very good search function where you can basically go and search for any song that's ever been recorded in the in any genre of metal that has the word Leonidas in it or or Cassandra. Though, as you can imagine, some of the more common names gets it gets a little harder to sift through. You know, is this the Cassandra they're talking about? But that's a great way to basically discover. You know, that there is possibly a heavy metal song, you know, written about this particular topic. And so that doing that sort of of research has has shown me that no, it's not just this sort of really niche thing that a handful of bands do in like Italy and Europe and Iron Maiden did it sort of. This is something that bands all over the world, okay, on almost every continent, okay, except except Antarctica, <laughs> do is they they are interested in, you know, Greek and Roman and Egyptian and Near Eastern antiquity as a great basis for for heavy metal music. And it's a great way to bring these stories to life, I think, you know, it, because I think something that we sort of lack to a large degree in when we just read these texts as philologists is kind of the emotional connection. Okay? Mm-hmm. We, we kind of read them with our brains rather than with kind of our other senses. And what I think heavy, heavy metal is a very visceral, you know, kind of emotionally charged genre of music. And so when you kind of, if you can kind of bring these stories to life with those sounds and, and that atmosphere and, of course, you know, vocal deliveries, then, you know, it, it really, you know, it's reception. It makes you look at these original texts in a new light. You know, so, for instance, there's a concept album by a, a I believe it's a Dutch band called Ex Libris, which is a on Medea, you know, you know, from her from Colchis to 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 Yolkis to Corinth. And there is a duet as one of the songs where it's basically her argument with Jason, you know, cool. in the Medea. It's not it's not adapting the original lines. It's it's a new set of lyrics, but it really shows you the potential to dramatize and kind of bring these voices to life that, you know, we often just read silently. Mm. And can you also access album art easily? Because metal mm-hmm. album art is some of the most detailed and interesting out there, really. And I imagine a lot of this also gets reflected in, in that place as well. Absolutely. And yes, in the metal archives, all, they always have 
usually they have album artwork with every release uh, that you can look at and it's you know it's it's fair use you know at least in the US uh so you know it's it's uh, you can use it and uh, yes you could you could do a lot of research just on album artwork and how they kind of transform antiquity to kind of align with some of the kind of the core ethos of of heavy metal um, with themes of just power violence hyper masculinity you know sexual deviance you know all these sort of transgressive themes and themes of power and tradition as well are often coming to the fore and that's reflected in the album artwork so for instance you know i think one example of that would be uh, there is a band from I believe argentina called axe battler and they have an album that is about it's kind of an anthology of Greek mythology, but the album artwork is specifically kind of their take on Theseus, it's not, not Theseus, uh, Perseus and Medusa, who are both represented on the album cover. And Perseus, if you look at him, you can see how they transform Perseus into something that you would expect, you know, kind of a, a heavy, he heavy metal hero to look like. He looks like mm -hmm. Conan the Barbarian. He looks exactly like the members of Man of War on their album covers, okay? <laughs> He's wearing a loincloth, he has long black hair, he is hyper muscular and he's kind of crouching down in kind of the foreground looking away from Medusa. And Medusa, on the other hand, looks a lot like the Medusa from Ray Harryhausen, okay, the claymation mm -hmm. monster that she's represented as in the original Clash of the Titans film. And this and where you see where you see I might be going here is heavy metal in appropriating ancient history and mythology. Yes, they a lot of them do kind of read the sources, but a lot of them are also at least inspired, if not entirely taking their conceptions of antiquity from popular culture, especially through the medium of film. Okay, mm -hmm. So you see this. So, for instance, tons of songs on the Spartans and Thermopylae are directly inspired by 300. Right. In fact, a lot of them came out within a couple years of the film and sort of go with that. But so for, for back to this album cover by Axe Battler, so we have Medusa represented that way, but there's also some differences. So heavy metal is all of that, at least traditionally, you know, has these themes of, you know, rebellion and individuality and power and transgression. And it also has, at least traditionally, a highly kind of patriarchal kind of masculinist bent a mm -hmm. and the flip side of that is it often uh has themes when pertaining to women as sort of these femme fatale and that's just one reason that medusa is such a popular topic in heavy metal classical reception is she seems this sort of archetypal femme fatale who regardless of what the sources say somehow becomes this figure who uses her uses charisma sexuality and even black magic in order to lure men to their doom and then she represents this sort of threat to masculine control a eh? and this is why say witches and for instance are also a very common common topic in 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 metal as well because they kind of represent these sort of forces beyond the control of 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 patriarchy that you know need to be subdued eh? mm -hmm. um, so the perseus and edusa myth is quite is is quite popular you know in these narratives though i'll get to another bit on that shortly mm -hmm. so the medusa in this album cover which i was about which i've been talking about the past 10 minutes sorry there's a lot of digressions <laughs> here but this is how my brain works yeah, uh, she <laughs> is represented as in this highly sexualized form much more so than the original harry house and medusa um, and so just the there's a very stark contrast between how she appears and how perseus appears so she you know she according to this album artwork she represents you know not just a threat of violence against human beings against men, but she represents the threat of sexual attraction okay, mm. to men so that her petrification of, of men is, you know, is a symbolic emasculation. Okay? Mm. And we see, you know, and there's a fair amount of heavy metal songs that, you know, draw upon that symbolism. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Ever since the band Anthrax had the song Medusa back in the mid 80s. And you can see if you read the lyrics to that song, there's a lot of sexual in innuendo there. So on the other hand, not every song on Medusa is like that, but you know, some of the earlier ones are. And because what we're sort of getting at with this is that heavy metal began as a largely white male working class phenomenon. Okay, it started mm -hmm. in Birmingham, England with Black Sabbath. And so the original audience for heavy metal were these, you know, were people of that demographic who kind mm -hmm. of were gravitated toward this music because this music allowed them to channel their frustrations with various elements of society during mm -hmm. the 1970s, during the Cold War, you know, all of the economic problems during that Patrick. time that, you know, Black Sabbath, you know, sang about in their music, the threat of nuclear war, drug use, all of these topics that rock and roll didn't really interrogate nearly as much. And so when Black Sabbath and other heavy metal bands kind of approached it more, op more head on, you know, this sort of group of disenchanted youth, you know, after the dream of the 60s sort of was shattered for them, found a refuge. And so up through the 80s, and then even up to today, metal is still largely, you know, male, white male dominated, though by now it has grown to be you know, globally comprehensive. So people of all mm. colors, classes, and creeds have joined the metal scene, not just as fans, but as as musicians, um, as journalists, uh, and as scholars of heavy metal, which is quite encouraging. And certainly there's a lot more women uh, and people of color and LGBTQ plus people, which, which was really helped when Rob Halford of Judas Priest came out mm -hmm. as gay a couple decades ago. And how that affects kind of classical reception in heavy metal is that we are getting more and more songs that are looking at these topics in a different light, in a more critical light. Mm -hmm. uh, so for instance, we have more bands with women musicians who are presenting Medusa more sympathetically as having more agency. Right. So there is a band from Italy called Evenor and they have women vocalists and they play symphonic metal and they have a song called tears of medusa in mm. which the vocalist sings as medusa and it is the lyrics of the song are very much in the style of something like ovid's heroides where she is actually writing a letter to poseidon a kind of try and she's basically trying to process what happened between her and him and what has happened to her as a result of that it really tries to bring the song into sort of a modern context of you know the myth was the myth is can be read more more than just you know the literal athena you know turned her into a gorgon because you know she was assaulted in her temple into mm -hmm. kind of an encounter where she's not sure what happened between her and poseidon but she knows that it wasn't good and mm -hmm. that she's kind of living the consequences of that and she feels like she's become i don't like this term spoiled goods or something like that or at mm -hmm. least she kind of has a self-blaming sort of tone to it not entirely but basically she has this idea that oh you know nobody wants to look at me anymore that mm -hmm. kind of thing those kind of frustrations uh, which is a very interesting take where neither is it you know making her a monster but not on the other hand it's not just making her some voiceless victim she is taking claiming her own voice here which we never get in the sources which is another great thing that this kind of reception does and she is kind of reflecting on this and trying to kind of make her own sense of it so so there's an example there there's another band from quebec called spectral wound that also have a different take here they have a song called slaughter of the medusa and in that song the real villain is both perseus and athena so for instance they basically it basically paints perseus as this sort of uh coward who used deception and didn't you know you know didn't, didn't play fair didn't play fair here and he was just some bastard son of zeus and everything and then <laughs> but the real monster at the end of the song it claims is is athena she is you know the real blight upon the world that um, mm. leads to this suffering 
A, which, you know, this being a black metal song, that genre is specifically very critical of religion. So there could be that kind of resonance there. So those are just a couple examples. There's some songs on Alexander that are more critical of him kind of saying, this is not just, this wasn't just some conquering hero. He had this dark side, this God complex. And even the Iron Maiden song acknowledges that a little bit Mm -hmm. where, you know, he, yes, he became a God, but he still he died in the end of a fever was a very kind of anticlimactic denouement there. So I think as metal has matured over what it's been now five decades since the early 70s, Mm. it has, I think there's become more nuance in taking a look at these myths. And I think that's partly as a result of metal becoming more inclusive and diverse and kind of interrogating its own you know, the toxic elements that tend to subsist when your culture is, you know, traditionally a kind of a white man type of thing. And you can think of parallels with a certain other field that we're, a couple of us are <laughs> I don't in. Know what yeah. you're yeah. talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's mo- so it's moving in good directions, but there's still a lot of toxicity and rot in the underbelly of the underground that it continually has to confront, mm-hmm. just as with many other groups, academic fields, as well as other you know cultures and, and countercultures. Do you find that the the historical material and the mythological material are used in largely the same ways, or do they put put them to different purposes. As I see it, I think they don't see the historical uh, material and the mythological material as being that much different, you know, kind of like how the Greeks and Romans would have viewed that. They would have viewed it as their history largely, at least as they present it, you know, in various genres of poetry. I'm pro- I'm hoping to write a paper on this someday, but I think the best ancient example of what you're getting at is the poetry of Lucan. I was Uh, wondering if Lucan, I was thinking Lucan surely has to be a fertile ground when you talked about finding the Aeneid as somewhat metal. I was all I could think of was (laughs) Lucan. I was just like, there is not a scene in that epic that could not be a song. (laughs) Yeah. There unsurprisingly, there doesn't appear to be much out there that directly adapts like the Pharsalia as like a concept album, but there's mm-hmm. plenty of songs on yeah. the civil wars, you know, plenty of songs with Julius Caesar as well as Octavian, Antony, and Cleopatra. Right. So that whole period of Roman history is definitely that potential is definitely has been tapped to the point where I'm hoping that more people branch out beyond those topics, you know, further back or further forward. But basically what Lucan did with with Livy and Caesar's commentaries is he basically turned it into epic poetry and made it much more, you know, mythological, you know, without necessarily putting gods and a divine apparatus in there the same way that Homer or Virgil did. But that, that's essentially what heavy metal does with, with ancient history, you know, with Alexander, the Spartans and various Roman topics is They present it with these various epic themes. So you have gods involved, you have kind of just supernatural occurrences and and monstrosities and things that you tend not to get in, you know, other, in, in say, historical writing. So it really does blend together, I think. So I know that, I mean, you've touched on it already, but maybe we can talk a little bit about it directly. One of the strands you've been looking at recently, because I saw a paper you gave on it, is about the specific overlap or the specific use of the ancient world by bands that have white supremacist leanings or ex- that are explicitly white mm-hmm. supremacist or even explicitly sort of hate groups, basically. Mm -hmm. And I know that that's, I mean, you've already talked about how that's by no means the only way that this material is used, but it is one of the ways, and it's probably in some ways, one of the ways that people might encounter it. So do you want to talk a little bit about that and what you've been been looking at? Absolutely. So for some context here, as I said before, a lot of the traditional Mm -hmm. themes of heavy metal is transgression and kind of reasserting individualism and power and in many cases masculinity as well as there's a lot of kind of a nostalgia for tradition or for 
a past that was before capitalist, industrial, neoliberal society came in and created all of this social alienation and globalization. Heavy metal being fundamentally antagonistic to the status quo means that how it expresses that antipathy and it rebels against it and expresses transgression against it can go in a number of directions, left or Mm -hmm. right. And a lot of bands do go to the right in response to that, though many do go to the left as well, or many bands simply use various transgressive symbols in order to kind of channel that disenchantment with various kind of institutions of political, social, economic conformity and control. Uh, So for instance, in metal, we wear a lot of black. There's a lot of kind of occult and satanic symbols that get thrown around. And, you know, the vast majority of people who use those symbols are not, you know, theological Satanists. They're not even Levian Satanists, philosophical Satanists. That's not what those symbols are for. Those symbols represent just simply... They're a rejection rather than than an allegiance. They're celebrating transgression and rebellion for its own sake as a fundamental good. It's basically saying that I am not a conformist to society. I reject a lot of what's going on today. And I'm basically using this art in order to channel that antipathy. And often the case, you know, to some is that you're expressing that simply to channel frustrations, but also it's often connected to kind of how you are active politically. So with bands that kind of go to the right with this transgression, when they also have an interest in ancient history or mythology, um, what often sort of intersects here is we start seeing them identify ancient Greece, ancient Rome as, and you know what's coming here, the (laughs) foundations of our precious Western civilization and culture. A. And this is especially the case with a lot of Italian bands and Greek bands, as you can imagine, but also a lot of European bands in general a, mm-hmm. um, sort of toe that line, as well as bands in North America also. So a topic that I am not going to address anytime soon is a larger topic, and it's a much thorner issue, is the intersection of nationalism mm-hmm. with classical reception and heavy metal, because that is a big factor in a lot of of this reception and also simply this sort of valorization of of you know euro european or euro your Euro-Ameri- american civilization and values and what those might be dog whistles for but mm-hmm. so that's a very broad and difficult topic uh, to address which i may get to someday but my priority now is for bands that go further than that. They are using narratives of the Persian Wars and of Alexander the Great and of various Roman emperors in order to advance a clearer political agenda that is clearly racist, xenophobic, anti-Semitic, and in in some cases, overtly fascist. Mm -hmm. And so there are hundreds of bands out there that are like this. Most of them are you know, very obscure, but some of them are, they have name recognition in the metal scene for better or worse. And just to put things in perspective, you know, these are a few hundred bands out of tens of thousands of bands okay, right. worldwide. So this is not to sweep this under the rug because this is the case of, this is a small minority of bands that still get a lot of airtime and they're still very influential in some in in some contexts okay so the numbers say one thing but not necessarily that doesn't mean that they aren't something that we can just ignore so that's kind of what i'm looking at because these bands kind of use heavy metal and the messages that they encode in it in order to express not just transgression of the status quo but also advocating what they want to put in in place of the status quo and who to blame for, you know, the status quo as it is. So for instance, you know, there's one subgenre of heavy metal called national socialist black metal. 
a, and these are bands um, that, as the label suggests, their lyrics, their symbolism, their album covers, and the political allegiances of their members are explicitly fascist. And so uh, a number of them do as you know, the Nazis did themselves. They looked to the Spartans, for instance, as models of proper masculinity. And these were kind of the archetype of the master race and the proper system of education, their eugenics, their subordination of the helots, for instance. You know, they looked at all of this and they said, this is an ideal that we need to re- to recapture here. And in kind of the broader context, a lot of these bands and not just the NSBM bands, they kind of have these themes of a coming apocalyptic war. You know, they're really into this kind of World War Three stuff, but they specifically see kind of World War Three as restarting civilization and clearing the table so that the values of ancient Sparta and Rome can be reinstated and that, you know, the proper human beings, the master race and whatnot can reassert itself because they have this belief that a a social Darwinist belief that Indo-European people are the most fit to survive and to rule everyone else. Right. So that sort of militarism is a big theme in in, in metal in general, okay, there's a lot of songs about war and, and everything, but this is this has definitely more of an explicit intent. And sometimes it's hard to kind of parse out whether a band it, singing about the Battle of Thermopylae is of those allegiances, okay, you know. Right, um, yeah. So, you know, and this is where you have to exercise care. Just because a band writes a song about the Spartans doesn't mean that they're fascists or nationalists or right wing. Mm-hmm. You have to consider other factors about the band itself, its other its other songs, what circles they operate in in order to then say, okay, in the context of the whole package here, this song about the Spartans, you know, seems to make sense in terms of what their what their ideology is but again you could write up a song about the battle of thermopylae and it be and be left wing so for instance one of the er, one of the first songs about the last stand of the 300 was from back in 1997 not 1999 rather i'm gonna say song called moment of truth by the it's what you call a crossover thrash band called stormtroopers of death which was uh <laughs> founded by Scott Ian, the the lead guy in in Anthrax. And, you know, crossover thrash is hardcore punk, you know, blended with thrash metal. And basically this, if you read the lyrics to this song, Moment of Truth, and I encourage you to listen to it, it's it's a pretty, it's a pretty, you know, it's a a pump you up kind of song. The message of that is simply, you know, this is, Thermopylae, it symbolizes kind of the general struggle of the few against the many against systems of imperialism and oppression and just sticking it to the man. You can't tell us what to do. It's better to die on your feet than live on your knees. You know, these kind of messages that have a pretty wide resonance. And also, if you read the song clearly, we see how narratives of battle and violence are also just ways of channeling kind of our animal instincts in a way, you know, it's, I, the analogy I would say is like playing violent video games, Mm -hmm. just because you play violent video games doesn't mean you're going to go out and, you know, murder people or whatever. It's a Mm -hmm. channel for, for that id, if you want to bring in kind of a Freudian thing in here, I'm not a psychologist. So and won't cut you up. It, yeah, there's a big discussion of, you know, read death metal lyrics, you know, about, you know, serial killers and all of that. And just because mm-hmm. Cannibal Corpse sings a song about, you know, literally smashing one's face with a hammer doesn't mean that either the band itself or people who listen to it are going to go out and, and do such a thing. A, it's there in order to respond to a need and fulfill that need rather than create that need. And so I think a lot of, and this gets into one of the major reasons why I think a lot of topics in ancient history and mythology, you know, resonates with heavy metal so well is it really gets at what one of the earliest kind of people writing on 
metal academically, Dina Weinstein theorizes. And she has this notion that metal is can be read in sort of religious terms as a kind of ditheism. A, there are two gods of heavy metal. One is chaos, a, and one is Dionysus. And so chaos, in, the, in more in the modern sense than, but also the ancient sense of its fundamentally negation, a mm -hmm. void, nihilism, but also kind of the antithesis of order. A. So this is kind of the idea that metal is very, is transgressive. It exists in order to always be there to challenge the norm the status quo, and to imagine it kind of processes the breakdown of these various systems, whether it be, you know, religion or political systems or the human body, for instance. Right. So you can, you can imagine that. But it's also Dionysus, okay? And he is the god in many ways also of breaking boundaries, transgression, mm -hmm. operating in these ambiguous spaces in terms of, say, gender, for instance. But he also represents, as the god of wine, the liberation of the senses, a, the ability to let loose of ecstasy, to step out of kind of the persona that we have to put on in our professional social lives. So for instance, a Dionysian ritual, I has many parallels with, say, a metal concert where you can put on a new identity, you can put on a different identity. There's a, you know, there's, it's a kind of a communal ritual. There is loud, boisterous music, okay? And there are various movements, moshing, head banging, whatnot, that induce sign of a trance. And then, of course, various substances are consumed mm -hmm. that assist that, you know, quasi-spiritual experience, though it's not required. It's just as, you know, a Dionysian ritual, you don't have to be on something. Mm -hmm. So the, kind of the point here is that unlike Plato, who says we can't have the gods doing all these mm -hmm. terrible things in our poetry because that will corrupt our children's souls and we can only have poetry that is, you know, praising the gods and everything. Instead, heavy metal is much more like the tragic theater, eh, where various taboos are transgressed and violence is represented in various ways and kind of the dark side of human nature and of the universe is laid bare. And you could get into sort of the Aristotelian theory of catharsis here, but I think that heavy metal definitely has that cathartic effect of when performing it, experiencing it, even or listening to it, that I think help is therapeutic in mm -hmm. a way, in the way that Aristotle or, you know, even modern psychologists might understand it. In fact, there are, there's a growing body of scholarship on the psychology of heavy metal and the notion of heavy metal as therapy. A, you know, mm -hmm. We're all the way back to Pythagoras here and various mm -hmm. philo Pythagorean philosophers are saying that certain types of music, you know, are medicinal for the soul. And I think heavy metal personally, at least to me, helps me remain as a well-adjusted person. And I think if, despite the stigmas that, you know, have um, been thrown at heavy metal since the 80s with the satanic panics and everything, you know, the vast mm -hmm. majority of metal fans are, I'd like to think, at least pretty well-adjusted people who live normal lives. And they just have this context that is either private or with a select group where they participate in this Dionysian ritual in order to maintain that balance in their lives and 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 yeah. and, and other you know psychological theories about Aristotle and everything that are probably anachronistic at this point but you know <laughs> that's how I like to make sense of it because it Mm -hmm. It justifies that heavy metal is a good thing, and I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but with with the caveat, and I just to bring it back to the what you mm. were talking about before that that you know where that line is because mm. when you're talking about say the bands that are explicitly advocating for particularly fascist mm -hmm. things, the question is, you know, uh, to what degree is it? that kind of cathartic play acting or whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it of like of the darkest impulses, which you would never want to put into practice. Mm -hmm. Or is it a reflection of a, of an, and, and, and also, you know, some, when you're talking about violence and then not doing violence, that's one thing. But when you're 
certain kinds of hate speech are violence in and of mm-hmm. themselves, even if nothing more is said, you know, that, so I guess that, that becomes then that a slippery area where you're, that you're trying to navigate around mm-hmm. and figure out what the edges are. Absolutely. And that is a, a great question about, you know, yes, we have songs like Hammer for Smashed Face about, mm-hmm. you know, brutally torturing and, and murdering people. But you also have songs by NSBM bands that talk about everything you'd expect, you know, violence against various ethnic groups. There's songs out there, for instance, that glorify the Emperor Titus because he destroyed, you know, he sacked Jerusalem the and, you know, the, and destroyed the temple and and all of that. And so where do you do you draw that line? You know, and I think, you know, the, lo- the, the line for me is, is this glorifying or advocating violence and discrimination against marginalized groups. Because I think fundamentally heavy metal should be about, you know, antipathy to majority and privileged and power institutions. Okay, that's why, for instance, a lot of heavy metal, especially black metal, death metal, more extreme genres, a lot of songs are frequently critical of Christianity. Because the majority of metal bands traditionally have been from majority Christian countries. And so that is the establishment that they are rebelling against. But as soon as, and so I think, and that's how metal should be. It should always challenge and question the status quo, but also the powers that be. However, when there is a redirection toward groups that are, you know, not in positions of power and privilege, groups that are marginalized, and you're re- and you're directing all of that energy against them, then I think, for, to me, that is a perversion of what heavy metal is. Also, the fact that me- heavy metal is very individualistic, and fascism is not <laughs> individualism. It's about <laughs> basically conformity to and obedience to, you know, an authority, whether it's Sparta's law of Lycurgus or Adolf Hitler or some combination thereof. Mm. And so I just don't see, so, you know, that doesn't make much sense to me. But again, and this gets at uh, another thing you brought up, Avon, is to what degree is, say, fascist imagery or mm-hmm. lyrics to what degree is this a reflection of political convictions and ideology that mm-hmm. the musicians want to advocate for and put into, tra- into practice? And to what degree is this simply performative, as you say? This is mm-hmm. simply transgression. Provocative. For its, it's provoca- exactly. It's transgression for its own sake. Okay? Mm-hmm. So, for instance, in the uh, 70s, when punk rock became a thing, you may recall that Sid Vicious and Susie and the Banshees, I think, also were starting to wear swastikas. Okay? Right. Not because they were Nazis, but because they found what could be probably the most transgressive symbol you could find. Okay? And mm-hmm. that's basically what they thought it stood for. Okay? You know, that and you know think of the sex pistols with very irreverent depictions of of the queen and everything and that was the point to them however that it didn't take long before punk rock started having you know actual nazis start to infiltrate it to the point or to to see it as sorry i just go ahead interrupt but but the the problem with that is that it signaled to people who want to find other fascists, let's say, mm-hmm. if you wear a swastika, they think I'm welcome there. Mm-hmm. And so like that, it's not even, you know, the Nazis were infiltrating them. Nazis were seeing them as like-minded, even if they weren't, because that's a signal you're giving off. Mm-hmm. And so that can become something that happens when mm-hmm. you when you pick up a symbol for one reason, people who see that symbol as something will, will gravitate towards you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so with punk rock, it had that kind of Nazi infiltration problem, Mm -hmm. but it also largely exorcised that element. Uh, You might recall, I think it was the uh, the Dead Kennedys, what they said Nazi punks should do. And they they largely did. It didn't go away entirely. But the thing is that that metal didn't have, you know, that moment where Nazi Mm -hmm. metalers or metalheads or whatever, they are very much found a haven in this genre. And it's very Mm -hmm. hard to get rid of this element to to deplatform it and to convince people not to support it 
partly because there is this kind of response from a lot of these artists who use this type of imagery saying, no, this is just a transgressive symbol, okay? These are meant to be shocking and provocative. Metal is fundamentally influenced by shock rock and all of that Mm -hmm. transgression for its own sake. And that we're not actually, we don't actually believe in this stuff. And that's a problem because Mm -hmm. there is... You know, in many cases, what they're doing is this, this is essentially gaslighting. Okay, this is plausible. Right. Trying to hide behind plausible deniability because the problem is, is that as you mentioned, Avon, a lot of people who do espouse those ideologies are drawn to this right. material that these musicians make, like moths to a flame. And so, and I'm going to bring in a bit more theory here. So, there's another, you know, important metal studies scholar named uh, Keith Con Harris and in one of his in his fundamental study on extreme metal specifically which is, tends to be the genre of me- genres of metal black metal death metal etc where these kind of right wing bands tend to tend to populate he came up with this sort of sociological term called anti reflexive reflexivity Okay. so let's let's now kind that's of that's a scholarly term yeah that's so you know that's what that essentially means is, I already mentioned it's it's essentially gaslighting. Mm-hmm. It's when an artist knows what they're doing is problematic, but they pretend not to know that it's problematic. Okay, so the reflexivity is you know you're self aware and you're you know what you're doing, whereas you know anti reflexivity is you know there's at least you're pretending ignorance. A, and you mm-hmm. basically use that, as I mentioned, for plausible deniability. And that's and it's often expressed with a band saying, you shouldn't take this seriously. This is just art. Okay? This is just pro- provocation. A, you know, we don't really mean it. Okay? This is just the way for us to channel our frustrations with society or, or whatever. But on the other hand, that's what they have written. Mm-hmm. And so this is what makes this sort of problematic as you can see in a very thorny issue and the other thing is it's not just interrogating you know the bands that do this but also the fans okay Mm -hmm. so some bands that engage in this imagery and these lyrics you know are not they're not card carrying nazis but on the other hand they are still you know there's still evidence even outside the lyrics that they are not that they are you know pretty far to the right and they will still go out in interviews and say i am not racist when clearly they're on record saying racist things and they have white supremacy in their lyrics and everything and people just take that at face value because what we're kind of getting at in here is again because the majority i think of metal fans still at least in a lot of countries are white men people of privilege they don't see you know fascists or racist lyrics or imagery as threatening to them so they are willing to ignore that and only decide, does this music sound good to me? And if mm-hmm. it does sound good to me, then I'm going to listen to it. Okay? I'm going to buy the CDs, I'm going to see them in concert, and I am going to do I'm going to separate the art from the artist. And this is something that I used to do. Okay? I didn't listen to explicitly Nazi bands years ago, but I did listen to a lot of bands that I don't listen to anymore because I believed that art, I tried to convince myself that regardless of what the artist believes or has done, okay, what kind of character they have, that has no bearing on the art that they create. And I can enjoy the art without endorsing whatever the artist believes or has done. Whether the artist is a white supremacist or is a sexual abuser or mm-hmm. or has murdered people. A eh? and when we're talking about artists in Norway where the maximum prison sentence is like 20 years, then we have this we are in this actual kind of situation with some mm-hmm. of those people. But when I started getting more serious about looking at classical reception in metal and I came across this issue in many places, I realized I'm a philologist. A, you know, we classicists, we medievalists, you know, we, we 
scholars of literature and culture and art and everything, art historians, we don't separate the art from the artist. We don't separate Virgil's Aeneid from the context of either Virgil's personal experiences or, you know, Augustan Rome or anything. Yes, I know that there's some theories out there where we should read art that way, but ultimately we tend mm -hmm. to keep those things as fundamentally inextricable. Eh? And so why would we do that to metal artists, okay, like, say, Varg Vikernitz, who is a Norwegian, one of a, a Norwegian uh, black metal musician who created a band called Burzum, which is an incredibly influential band in the black metal subgenre, stylistically, certainly. However, Varg Vikernitz also, you know, murdered one of his bandmates. He torched several churches in Norway in the early 90s. And he also writes and broadcasts on, at least he used to on YouTube and in books, clearly Eurocentric white supremacist views. Mm -hmm. And he often, and a lot of this happens a lot in metal. Um, he kind of appropriates Norse mythology for those purposes. And this is certainly, you know, those who see kind of the perception of medieval stuff in metal. This is also a thing that has to be contended with. But he also has ideas of kind of a wider Indo-European mythology that he incorporates in his writings. So for instance, he has an album where the artwork is a 19th century painting of the abduction of Persephone by Hades, a, and he mm -hmm. sort of integrates that into his view of, 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 of religion. He believes that a lot of artists, you know, who are sympathetic to his view in metal look at Christianity as, you know, not just Christianity, but also as an extension of Judaism. And so he sees the, say, the, the Christianization of Norway as ultimately as a mm -hmm. Judaization of, of Norway and what he saw as the destruction of Norse original Europe, in, you know, purely European religion uh, and culture and values, because he sees Christianity as just as foreign as as Judaism. And so a lot of artists, certainly in National Socialist Black Metal, um, but others have this, they, they combine, you know, those two religions into a single scapegoat and monolithic enemy and they use classical history and mythology you know as sort of their their ally in this so again you know songs that praise the emperor titus songs that praise antiochus the fourth and others mm -hmm. so so what can a metal fan do who you know wants to improve their community and not give a safe harbor for people who would co-opt it for white supremacist mm -hmm. fascist reasons. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess one thing is learn about the sources that they're drawing on, you know, take a, take a classics <laughs> course or, mm -hmm. or a medieval studies course and kind of better understand what they're doing. What else should they do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly what I've been doing is, you know, simply providing the information so, for instance, a lot of these artists that I talk about, it seems that a lot of folks who consume that music are just not aware uh, of these kind of problematic aspects of it, or that the versions of antiquity that they are presenting are not, you know, ne not necessarily the versions that either one are accurate or two that we should be taking as a model. A. So, for instance, bands that are inspired by the movie 300 will write lyrics and artwork and present the Spartans, you know, the way that the comic in the movie did. And that will present to a metal fan that, that will supply their understanding of, of Greek history, mm -hmm. which, you know, is, which is, you know, obviously is, is highly skewed. On the other hand, we have bands who also, you know, present things more or less accurately okay so bands that we have, there's a, there's some songs out there about the spartan cryptea and the terrorism against the helots and everything and the you know xenophobia xenelasia and all that of the spartans and it presents it as a positive model 
A, mm -hmm. and you know we don't, and so that's not good either. A, so not so not just presenting false information, but also presenting value judgments that you know we shouldn't be we shouldn't be making. A, and so I so I feel an obligation as a public scholar who operates in these two worlds in order to kind of mediate the classical world and and heavy metal in this way. And that's sort of what, you know, classicists in general, you know, sort of one of their functions for society are like that. So in terms, so that's sort of what I do in terms of what others can do is I, th I think it's just they have to approach, again, approach this with nuance because heavy metal is fundam fundamentally against things like censorship, a political censorship and any form of, you know, coercion. So we are not advocating that these bands, you know, be censored they, in any way. What we are advocating is that we suggest that they be deplatformed. Okay? And that's mm -hmm. different from censorship, despite what many people on the right would say. So for instance, you know, entities such as YouTube or concert venues, record labels, other streaming service services, they are private entities and they have the choice not to provide a platform to these artists. Okay? And ultimately the fans themselves, you know, have the right to make that choice as well. Okay, so, you know, kind of the, the approach I take is I I might tell somebody, here's what's Here's what's problematic about this music. I think it would be harmful in the grand scheme uh, if you continue to give these people your money, you know, see them mm -hmm. in concert and everything, because you are essentially, you know, supporting people who are advocating for these harmful ideologies. And, mm -hmm. you know, and then it's basically up to the consumer mm -hmm. to make an informed decision. So really, you know, it's, again, spreading this information mm -hmm. and really the more people in places of influence who can kind of make a stand against this stuff, the better. Okay, so we need journalists, we need prominent artists in the metal scene to take a stand against this stuff in order to kind of change the culture and change the way people think. It's really, we need a critical mass of people, you know, standing against this stuff. And the problem with metal uh, is that there's way too many people who are not taking the stand because they don't want to alienate uh, potential fans who would support them. It's like, you know, if some influential person on Twitter, you know, refuses to make a statement in support of a certain marginalized group because they might fear <laughs> alienating people who are antagonistic to that marginalized group. Okay, in, in metal, it, it's similar, a, you know, there's an economic incentive essentially exactly. to keep that to keep mm -hmm. that group of people because that's a big what you're saying is again not every fan in fact probably not the majority of fans by any means but a big enough group of fans for some of these bands anyway mm -hmm. that there's a a disincentive to, yeah. to 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 speak out yeah but nor should we coddle these people okay we need to be frank in saying that you are supporting hateful harmful ideologies by consuming this music right. and you know that is this is an ethical ultimately an ethical decision that you're making okay? so there's that so they need to know first they need to know the information because mm -hmm. as you say it's not always out there or obvious mm -hmm. people need to think to make a choice to find more out and to to realize that this is a potential problem with some of their music that they might mm -hmm. be listening to, spend some time figuring it out, and then make a choice as to whether or not to support it. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the what you're mm -hmm. outlining, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, I think one of the important ways to change the culture is to continue to not just deplatform these artists, but to platform and to support mm. artists who are representative, more interesting, basically, <laughs> or more interesting, but also representative of yeah. these marginalized groups. So, you know, mm -hmm. this is fundamentally a symptom of metal still being, you know, very white and, and, homogenous. and, yeah. homo and homogenous. But if there is uh, greater diversity and inclusivity of BIPOC and LGBTQ people and women and other and other groups, then 
I think the culture will change with it. And the more willing people of any demographic are willing to, you know, take a stand against these toxic elements if they feel that they are surrounded by more people who are willing to have their back, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. for instance. A. Yeah. So, you know, and we think about this, you know, on Twitter, for instance, we see this, say, on Classics Twitter, where there's a lot of people who are in a position to take a stand on these things because they know that they're, you know, there are allies Okay, there's a right. critical mass right. of allies there to to have their back, whereas you know in other contexts in the field of classics, they may not be as willing to speak up, you know, either as an ally or as somebody from a marginalized group because they're they're more isolated in you know in a situation uh, mm-hmm. like that. They're the only one of a handful of people at say an academic conference who are you know who isn't you know white, for instance, suddenly they feel a lot less able and willing to advocate for what is right. And mm-hmm. So, and that's what needs to happen in metal, you know, more, you know, we need to make way, we need to find ways in order to make metal just more welcoming of these groups. And it's not, and, you know, kind of, kind of doing away with the idea that metal is, you know, the uh, province of of certain types of groups, much as, you know, we have to get away with the idea that classics is the province of certain groups from certain countries. Right. It doesn't only belong to one right. group of people. Right. It doesn't only, not only one group of people get to be the gatekeepers, mm-hmm. et cetera. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. And that change will come when the gatekeepers, you know, change demographically because the most prominent artists in metal are still largely, you know, the white men. And that there's only uh, a handful of musicians who are very prominent, who are, you know, of other demographics, who are certainly very influential. So, for instance, there's a band, one of the, there's a very influential death metal band from New York called Suffocation, and their lead songwriter, guitarist Terrence Hobbs, is a black man. And so he's been very important in, you know, the moving to for the inclusion of people into metal. And But there's there's still a long way to go. Right. So it's really about platforming certain people and deplatforming others and not staying silent okay, in the face of these inequities and these and these these toxic and, and harmful ideologies. Because mm-hmm. and this is something I, I should add here if we want to go back to, you know, the, the right wing stuff is, you know, we have this conversation about, oh, they're just having fun they're just being transgressive and shocking for its own sake you know there's no harm Mm -hmm. in that it's just like playing a violent video game okay but the problem is is that there's evidence to the contrary a that the that these artists are politically and personally connected to extremist groups and that there is evidence that their music is being taken as advocacy Okay. Right. So some examples, for instance, so there are, you know, far right bands in Greece that are members of Golden Dawn. Even one of them was a member of parliament before the, the crackdown in uh, a year or so ago. And in the U.S., there are ties between various right wing bands and groups like I think they're called Atomwaffen and uh, the Wolves of Vinland and others. Mm. So there is there's continuity between art and politics here in that degree. Also, for instance, there was, and it's not just the musicians, but also fans. So for instance, there were people at the Charlottesville rally who were wearing mm-hmm. Burzum t-shirts, for instance. Right. And also there was, I think a couple of years ago, somebody in Louisiana who was a, a metal musician connected to a lot of those groups, I actually went and committed arson against uh, a number of black churches in Louisiana. Mm. Okay. So they're sort of kind of, they're inspired by you know, originally kind of what happened in Norway and blending it with their own grievances against uh, certain groups that they that they feel are are you know yeah with, the, with specifically American I think and America like, exactly yeah, yeah. exactly exactly okay. so again so it, it so it goes beyond just this is harmless art okay? and it's just 
you know, we got to change the culture. We got to get people in a position to feel comfortable speaking out. And the onus is on those who are in positions of privilege and power to be the ones to do a lot of that speaking out because they are the least vulnerable eh, uh, for doing so. Mm. And also they are simply, they have that capital, they have that influence mm by virtue of their, not just their, their social privilege, but also their prestige within, within the scene mm-hmm. to, to change the culture like that. So we just need more people stepping up and doing that. And so that's what I'm trying to do myself, you know, not just as a member of this metal scene, but as, you know, as a public scholar advocating for this change in both classics and the metal scene, which as we've discussed, you know, has uh, a lot of the same issues given given its history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely overlapping issues for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been fascinating and really like, I I think you've done a really good job, not only of telling us lots of things I didn't know about the, you know, world of metal, which is great, but also drawing those parallels, you know, that's, that's sort of like, you know, obviously they come out of different specific demographics, but the problems it leads to and the ways you have to think about, what needs to be done. You've, you've made those parallels really clear. And I think that's really helpful. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And again, the, you know, you know, those are, those are parallels that are negative, you know, that there, there's also parallels that are more positive, you know, between metal mm-hmm. and classics that are worth mm-hmm. mentioning. For instance, I, I always think of a classics conference as like a heavy metal festival, you know, the headliners are the keynotes, a, okay, and then mm-hmm. the panels are the various stages where bands, you know, are performing, you know, there's lots of drinking. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just, yeah. Well, classic, come conferences, together and social- classic conferences or medievalist conferences. And I think just a lot People of come together to socialize academic- over shared interests. Yeah, I mean, and, I, I think, I think that's, that's and, true. <laughs> and to be considered a member of the scene, there's a lot of that, you know, we can, you know, a lot of this is gatekeeping, but on the other hand, there is a, there is a history of, the discipline and mm-hmm. of the art and the literature that we study that you're, you know, to some degree expected to be familiar with. So in classics, you should be familiar with your Homer and your Virgil and your Cicero and everything. Whereas in metal, you should be expected to be familiar with your Judas Priest, your Iron Maiden, <laughs> your Morbid Angel, etc. Even if you may specialize in certain subgenres of metal like oh i'm uh i mainly listen to you know black metal from this specific region this specific <laughs> style much as you know somebody might specialize in neuronian poetry and all of that mm-hmm. but on the other hand you can go to a metal concert and not know any about any of this stuff and still have a good time and yeah. participate and Hopefully there will be people there in that space who will welcome you, you know, but there will also be the gatekeepy people who will (laughs) see you as an outsider who is intruding into this hermetically sealed space that exists for the purpose of being elite and all of that. And so these sort of, this sort of elitism and gatekeeping happens in both, in both places that Mm -hmm. is worth interrogating keeping an eye out for yeah Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah the the positive side of that is the is the joy of nerdery right Mm -hmm. like the 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 joy of finding somebody else who cares deeply about the details of whatever you care deeply about that Mm -hmm. is so wonderful in in these things and then the the negative side is when that's used as a Mm -hmm. a way of dividing the newbies from the real fans or whatever but i think those those two tendencies can push against each other in both fields (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah and you know, just, and one last thing on this is when you view heavy metal, its culture and its music and everything as a parallel to classics, it really reinforces the idea that classics is reception. Okay? Mm. Uh, so in heavy metal, there's new music being written and performed and recorded. And that music is ultimately, you know, a reception of earlier music that was produced okay there's right. there's a genealogy of influence here and style and everything there's innovation but there's also a lot of 
you know, fundamentally reception of a tradition, of a canon, if you will. Mm-hmm. And if you look at classics that way, it really gives you a sense that the reception of classics, the tradition, uh, the classical tradition, if you will, is very much in line with that. And that's what we mm-hmm. are studying here. We're not just, a metal concert is not just, you know, either you're seeing Iron Maiden itself or you are watching people play Iron Maiden covers. You're watching people play something in the style of Iron Maiden eh? or combining various influences. And then in classics, we shouldn't just be studying Virgil. We should be studying the reception of those myths later uh, in later traditions. So that's sort of my way of saying that, you know, classical reception is just as valid. Reception studies Mm -hmm. is an important part of a fundamental part of classics. And it's not just Mm -hmm. this trendy thing that you do if you aren't a serious philologist. Eh? That's like a metal fan who only listens to, you know, the classics from the 80s. And I right. use the word classics there intentionally. Eh? <laughs> I don't listen to any new bands because nobody plays the way that Metallica played in their first two albums or something. And now I'm looking forward to listening to that song about uh, Medusa that you mentioned earlier, because that sounds really interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yes. as you, you said, you'd give us some links and playlists. So if you would want to put something together uh, and send it to me afterwards, I'd love to put up some some links and some suggested listening, because I'm sure lots of people would be would be interested in following that up. Yeah, I can throw together a Spotify playlist of as much as I can that's available on Spotify. Some of the, the music that I name drop. Yeah, some of it's going to be hard to find. But yeah, some of the stuff's obscure. Obviously, I won't put any of the, you know, the fascist yeah, stuff no, on there. No, <laughs> right. Put the good stuff that we uh, that we should be interested in right, hearing. And right. we'll, we'll take we'll take your right. word on the other stuff. <laughs> yeah, thankfully, Spotify, you know, tends to not to have, not have that as stuff much of that yeah. stuff, at least. But yeah, I can throw that together. Yeah, provide, we'll provide we'll that put that in the show stuff. notes for people. Sounds good. Yeah. And on that note also, how can people find you if they're interested in following up on any of this or, for instance, talking metal, <laughs> talking mm-hmm. heavy metal with you? All right. Well, probably the easiest way is to follow me on Twitter. I am at Metal Classicist. And you can also, I have a Facebook page called Heavy Metal in the Ancient Worlds. And also I have a blog, which is heavymetalclassicist.home.blog. Mm-hmm. I believe. I'll link these yes. things as well, of yep. course. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk about this stuff. <laughs> it's my bread and butter. I also, you know, study other things. If you're, I know. More... <laughs> there's always there's always more we could get to. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not a <laughs> but I'm not a one trick pony. I also, <laughs> you know, study things like the Roman Emperor Julian, late antiquity, um, right. the reception of early Rome in imperial literature. You know. We can only talk about one large thing. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> as, as usual, you know, reception people usually have their more "quote unquote" traditional, you know, yeah, discipline right. fields as well, uh, yeah. specialties <laughs> in addition to you know, the fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. This is this has been a, a great conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really appreciate you sharing yeah. all of this with us. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Happy to. It, it really helps me kind of process what I'm doing here and reflect <laughs> on on it and remind myself that this is this is worthwhile. That this is <laughs> something that is not only something that I hope is interesting to people, but also this is something important to talk about and to think about and to see alongside you know some larger issues that are going on in the world. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. so thank you for the opportunity to help me kind of <laughs> muse about that because it helps me too. Anyway. That's good. Yeah. All right. Thanks. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. 
And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.